Welcome to the Living Without Fossil Fuel slideshow. Um, this is a second version of this slideshow that I've created because the first version had very low audio levels um, and you couldn't hear it very well on your speakers. This one I'm recording with much higher audio levels. It's the same set of pictures. I do not read from a script, so there might be some variation in what I say or how I say it, um, but it's basically the same slideshow. All opinions expressed in this presentation are solely those of the author. The author does not speak as a representative of any other person or organization. So I'm going to talk a lot about Living Energy Farm. Uh, that's this project over here, but there are many people involved in that project who may or may not share my opinions or my interpretations of things. Um, uh, this slide also displays a few other things I have published. Uh, this book over here is called Integrated Activism. It was published recently by uh, North Atlantic Books out of Berkeley. Uh, this is Perennial Food, Easy and Reliable Methods for Growing Fruits and Nuts. That's on my website. That's a pamphlet that I have published. Culture Change is another book I have published. Uh, my website is conev.org. Living Energy Farm is livingenergyfarm.org. And I'm also involved with the communities movement, and that website is ic.org. Um, so we're going to talk about various aspects of living with uh, little or no fossil fuel. Um, the primary contributor, the biggest sector contributing to uh, greenhouse gases in the United States is the residential sector, the energy we use to heat and cool uh, homes in the United States in the industrial world. So how we live is a big issue. It's not the only issue, issue but it's a very big issue. Uh, we're going to start out here just talking about basic passive solar design. Basic passive solar is no more or less complex than simply putting windows on the south side of your house um, and then putting a bit of an overhang. At our latitude, you want about as much distance from the top of the window to the bottom of the overhang as from the edge of the house out to the edge of the overhang. And what happens is in the winter, our sun angles down near 30 degrees. The sun comes in those windows and warms up the house. And as the seasons change, when you get up to summer, the summer sun angle is up much higher and is blocked by the eaves overhanging the house. Um, passive solar is a very effective way to make a house more comfortable, more comfortable, um, better lit. Um, it's uh, amazing to me that all houses are not passive solar, that so many are not, um, because it's no more expensive than building an ordinary house and it makes the house a lot more pleasant to live in. So why so many houses ignore passive solar is, is difficult for me to comprehend. It's a very effective, very simple way to um, save energy. This is one look at our uh, passive solar from Living Energy Farm. This is the kitchen building that we're working on. You can see uh, these big windows facing south. This is a shot from inside the building, but I also got this perspective from inside the building so you can see these thick walls. These are the window boxes. Um, we build stud frame and then drop straw bales in behind the studs, basically. Um, it's the cheapest, easiest way I know of to do a thick wall, well insulated, uh, solar oriented house. Um, here's a drawing of how that works. You have your ordinary foundation and straw bale uh, walls. I've used, with, for building code, of course, you have to have concrete or cinder block foundation. Uh, off, if you're not building to code, you can use stacked rocks or various other things. Um, so the walls can be built. Straw bale is easy. I've used straw bale. This particular uh, shed down here is actually built with crumpled up newspaper. Um, I've built with crumpled up newspaper, leaves, straw, bamboo, all sorts of things. Um, that particular shed is a tool shed that I built. Um, I wanted to be able to work in that tool shed in the summer and not get baked by the summer sun. So there's two feet of crumpled up newspaper in the roof of that shed and it works quite well. It stays uh, very pleasant uh, in there in the summer. I sleep out there sometimes in the summer and I can sleep out there all summer without even a fan, never mind an air conditioner. Um, because it's well ventilated, there's windows on three sides, and it's insulated. Um, so the idea that green building is difficult or expensive or more complex than ordinary building is, is just plain wrong. The history of, of uh, what has dominating, dominated the design or the evolution of design of houses in the United States, perhaps in the rest of the industrial world, is... Uh, what rich people have done historically to separate themselves from poor people, um, basically they build big spacious houses with thin walls because that's what they can do, and then 
as everybody else gets richer, they imitate that. The um, the hovels and shacks of poor people dating back eons built out of mud and straw that were close to the ground and had thicker walls um, and were more likely to look like this uh, than the big McMansions you see now. Um, those houses were often those houses were often better insulated, and you can build thick, well insulated walls with mud, straw, a lot of different materials. Baled straw is easy because you can get it, um, and it insulates well. But there are many, many options, and it's no more expensive or difficult or complicated than any other way of building. It simply involves breaking cultural norms. Um, the other advantages of these nice thick walls is you end up with these big thick window sills. That's a windowsill from a house that I have built. Uh, it serves as a greenhouse basically in the summertime or in the wintertime. Um, so you can put plants up there which I like to do. Um, and in this case we have a nice tile job on that windowsill so nobody sets it on fire with a candle. Um, at Living Energy Farm, I'm the primary designer there. Um, we wanted to come up with a very effective solar design uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want to be able to live without fossil fuel and not be cold and hungry. So we want something that's going to work well for us, but we also wanted to design it very cheaply so that it can be replicated easily. Now, uh, there's two basic kinds of solar, or many kinds, but the terminology, passive solar refers to, as I pointed out, simply having windows that allow the, the light and the heat to come in. Active solar is when you actually use pumps to pump air or fluid from a solar collector down into the house for one purpose or another. Um, the most common systems are fluid-based. I've built a number of fluid-based systems. They use water or antifreeze. Um, you have uh, solar collectors. If this is a south-facing roof, you generally kick the collector up to 60 degrees because remember your winter sun angle is at 30. So if you're at 90 degrees to 30 degrees, uh, that means 60 degrees, if that makes sense. So a steep southern roof um, or a steep set of collectors. Uh, for fluid-based systems, you need corrosion-resistant collectors. Um, that has come to mean copper flat plate collectors, which are quite expensive. So for uh, Living Energy Farm, we want a good solar design. We also don't want to have to chop a lot of firewood because that's a lot of work. And if you don't have a chainsaw, it's a lot of work, although crosscut saws are quite effective. Um, so what we came up with is a forced air system. Now they built forced air systems back in the 70s and 80s, and they made some foolish assumptions that I think really crippled the systems. Number one, they built them in poorly insulated houses. Number two, they tried to mimic um, uh, fossil fuel system, so they assumed they had to have a really narrow temper temperature differential, um, two or three degrees, 68 to 70 or whatever, um, and then they would uh, build a big rock bed uh, outside of the house, they'd take the heat off the roof, blow it into the rock bed, have a big battery bank that would blow the heat back into the house at night. Uh, that required a lot of stored energy, uh, stored in batteries or whatever, um, as well as a fancy uh, computer controlled systems to monitor the heat in your various heat sources and very messy. All we're doing here is we've uh, put some substrate under the uh, floor, just larger rocks basically, so the air can make its way through there. We have a pipe on each side that collects and distributes the air. We have a blower that pulls the air off of the solar collectors on the roof, uh, takes it down, blows it under the floor and back up to the roof. So this is a radiant floor system similar to the fluid-based radiant floor systems, except in this case the, uh, the heat transfer medium is air. Um, this is also made possible because the uh, availability and cheapness of, of photovoltaic uh, power has come down quite a bit, so it's now a lot more feasible. You have to have a much bigger motor to move heat with air than you do with fluid because of the density, because uh, fluid is so dense it will transfer heat very effectively air is so fluffy that you need a bigger motor to run a bigger fan to move heat uh, with a blower. Uh, you can heat a house with a three-quarter inch pipe if you're using fluid. If you're using air, it takes 10 or 12 inch pipe and a big blower. Uh, so it's a lot more umph. But with the decrease in the cost of photovoltaic, that's now more possible. Uh, this is another shot. The outside of that same building I just showed you, this is our kitchen building, showing you that steep southern roof uh, we haven't put the glass over this roof yet. Uh, this is taken in the recent ice storm, but you can see the steep southern roof, steep southern roof, the air uh, pipes at the bottom, and the air pipes at the top. Um, so there'll be a blower uh, right over here, actually, that will pull air from a, a trunk duct that connects uh, to those pipes uh, down to here. There's, there will be glass in front of this metal, and there's already insulation foam behind it. Um, that hot heated air will go around, just as I described. And you also see the passive, the solar windows here that collect heat. Um, this is uh, that 
same style of construction, but an earlier picture, right where this young woman is sitting, is where the trunk duct goes. You'll notice we're using perimeter insulation and quite a lot of it, uh, well more than building reco code requires. Um, and that foam for us, by the way, is, is reclaimed foam. We were able to find a source. It's actually insulationdepot.com if you're looking for it. Uh, they reclaim uh, waste industrial foam that you can then use. Um, so where she is sitting is where the, the pipes go that distribute the heat and then it blows under the floor there uh, to heat our house. Um, that is the pipe itself. That is a 10 inch pipe. Uh, you can see the, the floor, the concrete that we poured around there. Um, these two pipes are also very interesting. Um, instead of having one water pipe coming into the house, we have one coming in and one going back out. Um, as a farm, we're making our living selling seeds, open pollinated seeds, which is another story we won't delve into here extensively, um, but open pollinated seeds. Um, it's it's uh, plants that can pollinate each other indefinitely as opposed to hybrid and modern seeds that are kind of a dead end. You have to keep going, buying your seed from the corporate seed company. So we grow the seeds. If you go buy open pollinated seeds from a seed company, we're the ones who created the seeds. Well, we need irrigation water to do that. We have our solar pumped well that runs off of the same set of solar pumps that runs the blowers to heat the hot, to he blow air down this pipe that heats the house. Uh, so in the wintertime, those blowers and that solar rack uh, blows heat to heat the house. In the summertime, it pumps water. And the water comes in this pipe into the house where it soaks up heat in a big inverse radiator, basically. Uh, so a radiator that collects heat instead of distributes heat. Um, and then it sends the irrigation water back out this pipe, back out to the field where uh, we use drip irrigation to irrigate the field. Basically, we're getting free air conditioning from our solar pumped uh, irrigation water. Uh, now, it's important to recognize that not everybody can do this. Um, you have to be in a rural area. You have to pump modest amounts of water. If you overpump the groundwater, you've got a big problem. But uh, we'll talk about this more as we go along. But the importance of scaling is, is scaling is what makes environmental technologies or renewable energy work or not work. It's enormously important. But we'll talk about that as we go along. Another very simple technology, uh, solar hot water. Uh, again, why everybody doesn't have one of these is baffling to me. They're so effective. There's various kinds of solar hot water. This is the simplest over here. This is a batch collector. That's simply an insulated metal box with a glass pane over it. In this case, double pane glass. Um, uh, there are two hot water tanks in there. The simplest version of this is simply to take an old refrigerator, pop the door off, uh, put a water heater tank in there, strip the insulation off the water heater tank, uh, paint it black, put it in there, um, put a piece of glass over it and you've got a very effective batch collector it's called. Now this one has two tanks and they're actually stainless tanks which makes it a bit nicer. Um, if you do put more than one tank do not run the water in series. That's what the person who did before us who had this system who donated it to us had done that. That's really quite silly. You bring your cold water in the bottom of the tanks, uh, tee it off to both tanks out the top, collect your water and run it off to the shower or sink or wherever you need to use it. Very simple, very effective hot water collection system. Um, a lot of people will take and build something like this and put a coil of pipe in there. That does not work. It will not work. It will not ever work to heat anything other than a tiny amount of water. You need a water tank in your batch collector if you have a batch collector. Now, the far more common uh, kind of system that's more effective but quite a bit more expensive and complicated is the flat plate system. And this is a drawing of it here where you have a flat plate collector, um, which is a thinner metal box with copper tubes running through it and fins connected to the tubes and a piece, single pane piece of glass in front of that usually. Uh, you pump either water or glycol up there, um, whether it's a drain back or a closed loop system. I'm not going to explain that in great detail right here, but in any case, uh, to come down and heats up the water in the, solar, in the storage tanks. The advantage of a flat plate system versus a uh, batch collector is the flat plate system can store heat for days because the, the heat is down in an insulated tank in your house somewhere these tanks are still somewhat exposed to the weather. So a batch collector works fine, but it has a much more of an up-down kind of temperature curve. The flat plate systems have a much more level kind of temperature curve. They don't lose heat so easily. Another technology that we're using at Living Energy Farm is solar cooking. We have a couple of different kinds of solar cookers. This is a parabolic cooker. We refer to it affectionately as the death ray um, because you can hold a stick out in front of it uh, right about where that pot is at the focal point and it will set a stick on fire in about three seconds. It's only about four foot across and it has the BTU output of a gas burner on medium or medium low on a sunny day. Um, it has a mechanism up under it that allows us to rotate it and point it. It needs to be pointed uh, directly at the sun. This is a four foot or so collector, wide collector. 
Um, there are a lot of uh, collectors, generally they're a little bit larger than this, six, six foot or more, uh, used in, uh, in the undeveloped world or less developed world. This one works quite well. It's super easy, super effective. Uh, it does look like a satellite dish. You can, in fact, uh, use a satellite dish. The reflective material is a bit tricky. Um, you can use a mosaic mirror uh, on that uh, satellite dish if you're making your own. Um, there's a company called Clear Dome Solar that sells reflective materials. You can use Mylar, but Mylar will only last a few years. Um, those are your options as far as I know for reflective material. We also have a solar oven. Um, again, we have reflectors up here. Uh, that uh, Solar ovens are effective. The parabolic cooker will work in any season more or less. I mean, the cooking does slow down a bit in the winter, but it's still pretty effective in the winter. The solar oven doesn't really work very well in the winter, at least in terms of baking. Uh, in the summertime, you can bake with it. We baked cookies and whatnot with it, although we have used it more often as a uh, dryer than as a solar cooker. You'll notice it's got um, wheels here that are turned 90 degrees to each other, so that wheel is 90 degrees to that one, which is 90 degrees to the next one, which is 90 degrees to the next one, which means that when you give it a little shove, it, it rotates on an axis without falling off of its little platform there. Um, this is another technology we have developed for cooking. Cooking, oddly enough, seems to be our biggest energy use at Living Energy Farm. Uh, this is a biogas system. To your left here is the digester itself. That's a 55-gallon drum uh, full of uh, manure and feed, uh, food scraps and whatnot. Uh, it is then filled up with water. Uh, the water, over time, over about six weeks, uh, it becomes an anaerobic environment, meaning oxygen-free or largely oxygen-free. And the anaerobic bacteria that live in that environment um, generate methane, which is also known as natural gas, which make their way up that tube uh, over to this. This is a barrel floating in a barrel, so as the methane pushes its way into that barrel, this blue barrel lifts itself up. Um, you can see the shadow of the fluid level line here. There's a drain pipe right at that fluid level line, so as you pour material in, uh, the drain pipe, uh, which picks up fluid from the middle of the barrel, drains it out, and then we use that for fertilizer or whatever. Uh, and then this gas line has a T off of it, which we can bring over here and we use to cook with. Um, this is a small system. You're going to need to keep your system warm and feed it every day. Uh, and then, even then, these systems do not put out an enormous amount of gas compared to what we're used to. This one, we've only run it for a short time now. And we find that we can get about enough gas to cook one meal every two weeks or so. Um, the other interesting question, these things have been built particularly in China. China built hundreds of thousands or millions of these in prior decades uh, on family and village level systems. Um, the question of methane leakage, methane is a very uh, powerful um, greenhouse gas. So whether or not it really makes sense to be building millions more of these, and they're, they're bound to leak at least a little bit. I don't have an answer to that question, but it is something we need to think about. I'm not sure if it's the best technology for generating cooking fuel or not but it's one that we're working with. Um, there are other ones as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, another thing that needs to happen on a farm is we need to move water around quite a bit. We need irrigation water, we need water for domestic use, we need drinking water, and we need to do that uh, sustainably. Um, we have hand pumps, old-fashioned iron piston pumps uh, that we pump by hand, and uh, these are actually two motor-driven hand pumps. That's a 300-watt scooter motor, this is a 100 watt uh, DC motor. These pumps are essentially identical. That one's a green one, that one's black, but they're basically the same pump. The advantage of these old piston pumps, the way this works is there's a motor there that spins, this pulley spins around, that's got a little mechanism in there, and this uh, little rod right there goes back and forth, back and forth, and pushes a piston back and forth, which sucks in water, pushes out water alternately, and pushes water out wherever you want to take it. The advantage of these old piston pumps is that they will run at any speed. So if the sun is bright and the pump's running at full speed, it'll run fast and pump more water. If the sun is, goes behind a cloud, it'll slow down, but it'll still keep pumping. Um, so we have a 300-watt motor up here, and we spin this pump quite a bit faster than this pump, which is a 100-watt motor. We've got it belted down so it spins much slower, and they both work just fine. This one will pump 10 gallons a minute. This one's probably 3 gallons a minute, even at its best. Um, these pumps are also infinitely rebuildable. They're just cast iron, so if you don't let them freeze in the winter, they last forever. Uh, they have leather cups down there that you can replace fairly easily. The valves are fairly easily worked on. 
Um, and you can also turn this pulley here with uh, an exercise bike, or um, you can turn it by hand. You can turn it by any means. So it's a very simple, very low-tech form of pump. So what we've done at Living Energy Farm is we try to layer our technologies. We might have a new, expensive, efficient technology, um, but those new, expensive, efficient technologies are black boxes often. So we have a submersible pump in our well, which is an $1,800 pump. Uh, the submersible pumps, there's Robeson pumps, uh, Grunfos makes one called SQ Flex, Sun Pumps makes them. I strongly recommend sticking with the brushless pumps, not the uh, brush motor pumps. Um, but in any case, those pumps are, for the most part, a black box. It runs, it runs great, but when it breaks, it's done. These little pumps that you're looking at on the slide are not black boxes. They are, uh, the motor itself is not necessarily easily repaired, although sometimes you can. Um, but the pump itself, uh, if you had to, like I said, you can turn it by hand. So we're layering our technologies. We might have a, a modern, efficient black box, but under that we want something simpler, more efficient, uh, more durable, renewable in the long run. Uh, this is the solar rack that runs our main well, that runs the submersible pump I was telling you about. This is two pictures, one when I was building it and one after it was done for a little while. Uh, that's six 30-volt um, uh, PV uh, collectors, photovoltaic electric collectors. So you stack them up in series and get about 180 volts, which is allows you to push the uh, electricity more easily down a wire. Higher voltage lets the you get less uh, loss in your wiring. Um, this is the system I was saying that runs our pump. It also runs the blowers in the house. We have about 2,300 watts total, um, and I think we can easily support uh, a dozen or two dozen people with that much power not only res in terms of their residential needs, but in terms of everything we need to support that many or more people economically to earn a living, that is. Um, another technology that we are uh, using is nickel iron batteries. Um, people are far more familiar with the lead acid batteries, like the battery that's in your car. The advantage of lead acid batteries is they have a very high ampacity uh, in an immediate sense. You can turn the switch and it will dump a bunch of power in a very short amount of time, which is the reason they work for starting cars. The disadvantages of lead acid batteries are that they wear out very quickly. They usually only last um, five years, maybe seven or eight. Uh, I've seen them burn out in three years. Um, they're also very toxic. They're made of lead. Uh, we ship them to the third world. A lot of people are poisoned using them or trying to recycle them in the third world. Um, I shouldn't say third world, but less developed world, less industrialized world perhaps. Um, and then the sulfuric acid, lead acid batteries are dangerous. They can hurt you badly in various ways. An old technology, this, uh, this is John, a friend of mine, holding an old-fashioned nickel iron battery. And you can see over here on the right, made by Thomas Edison Incorporated. This is an original Thomas Edison battery made by his company many, many, many years ago. And it still works. The advantage of nickel iron batteries is they're extremely durable. They last a long, long time, as you can see from this picture. Um, they have a much deeper uh, ampacity cycle. So a nickel iron, a lead, uh, a lead acid battery, in order to prevent uh, damage to the battery, you generally don't want to drain it beyond 5% of its total capacity. You want to keep it 95% charged if possible. Um, a nickel iron battery is kind of the opposite. You can drain it about 95% without uh, damaging the battery. So nickel iron batteries, they also have a, the nickel irons also have a higher standby loss, so if you're not charging them on a regular basis, they will lose more power, but they're very durable, they have a very deep cycle, so for running, uh, what we're doing with them, we don't have receptacles in our house, uh, we simply run uh, LEDs, uh, DC LED lighting, which is very efficient, they're perfect for that use because it's kind of a slow, steady, long-term kind of use, uh, and we want durable batteries. Um, there's the uh, two uh, photovoltaic panels that are running. They're currently running our construction tools, um, but they are going to run the nickel iron batteries. I've got a charge controller that will work for both um, kinds. That's a Xantrex C40, I believe. Um, these are panels are in par parallel, so they're each 30-volt uh, panels, which will then charge a 24-volt uh, nickel iron system. Um, Another technology we're using at Living Energy Farm is wood gas. This is a picture that dates back to the World War II era. Uh, in World War II, things were a terrible mess in Europe in particular as regards the availability of fuel, fossil fuel. So people turned to this technology called wood gas. Uh, the wood gasifier in this case is this silver contraption bolted onto the side of the truck. It's full of wood chips. Uh, 
And then down at the bar bottom, there's a hearth of sorts. This is called an ember gasifier, um, named after a French person, so it's probably Imbert or something like that in the French. Um, the wood chips in that gasifier are partially burned, basically. Uh, essentially, it's a carbon monoxide generator, although there are some other gases that are generated in the process. And you don't think of carbon monoxide as a fuel, but in fact, if you take the output of that gasifier, which is carbon monoxide and a little bit of other stuff, and you take it into the intake of a gasoline engine with roughly a 50-50 uh, air gas mix, you get something that will run the engine at about 80% of the rated horsepower. In Europe, there was a very large-scale conversion to uh, wood gasification in World War II, particularly on for farming equipment because people needed to eat, so they switched the tractors and the trucks and whatnot. Uh, to gasifiers to keep people fed. And even in the short span of World War II, which was only a few years, there was significant deforestation. So one has to keep in mind that uh, biofuel, uh, as we know it, the idea that we can run the industrial economy on biofuel is crazy. It's wrong. It's misinformed. Um, the estimates I've seen say that in the United States, if you take the entire United States and you add up all the photosynthetic product, meaning every wild tree leaf, every every soybean, every kernel of corn or wheat, everything that grows in the United States in a single year, if you burned all of that, you'd have about 25 percent less energy than we actually use uh, to fuel our industrial economy and we'd have no food, never mind uh, paper or toilet paper or anything else we use. So the idea that you can use biofuel to fuel the modern industrial economy is historically misinformed, it's wrong, uh, it just isn't going to work. But on a farm scale, um, we believe that we can use uh, biofuel, uh, we can use, in this case, wood gas. Uh, what wood gas gives us is um, a concentrated energy source that we can haul around on the front of a, of a gasoline tractor to plow the fields. Because if you've ever tried to plow a field by hand, uh, you know the need for some mechanical power of some sort, or some, some sort of uh, auxiliary power. So we have two old gasoline tractors here. This is the old Fords. This is an old 1961 uh, Ford. That's an old 1939 over there. Uh, so the gasifier is getting bolted onto this tractor. Uh, it'll run that tractor. That, for us, is our new modern technology. Um, under that, we're going to have uh, the, the simpler, more renewable technology is that we're going to have is draft animals. Uh, the oxen on the left belong to a friend of ours. These smaller ones on the right uh, are our oxen, although we have since put those into an early retirement, and I think we're headed towards a set of mules at this point. Uh, oxen, mules, and horses all have different trade-offs. The mules and horses will give you more work, um, but the oxen, are, the oxen are just trained cows or trained steers. So they're easier to come by, they're much cheaper. Um, the trade-off with any kind of draft animal is that about a third of your land, uh, if you're running a farm on draft animals, has to go into feeding the draft animals. So I don't think we can feed seven or eight billion people with nothing but draft animals. But in terms of looking forward to the future, developing appropriately scaled farms that have some combination of these renewable energy technologies, such as wood gas and draft animals, uh, is where we have to head, I think, for a sustainable future. Now, our bylaws at Living Energy Farm do not allow us to take the wood gas out on the road. It's simply an on-the-farm use. So we're not allowed by our own agreements to build a wood gas truck and drive it down the road. We can only run the tractors with it. Another technology that we are having at Living Energy Farm that I have built in other places is uh, composting toilets. The purpose of a composting toilet is to uh, reclaim some of the nutrients in human waste, um, as well as to reduce, reduce water pollution and various other issues connected with um, the water-based sewage treatment systems we have, which, by the way, also use up a phenomenal amount of energy. The uh, water-based sewage systems, they have to have these huge air blowers to blow air through these big tanks. Um, uses up a lot of energy. So composting toilets are much better. Um, if you're strictly looking at it from the per, uh, perspective of um, capturing the nutrients in human waste, then using night soil, as is done in much of the undeveloped world, where human waste are put out in a field, that captures all of the nitrogen or almost all of the nitrogen in uh, the human waste. Uh, composting human waste in a composter, you're going to lose some of the nitrogen, but the big issue, of course, is pathogen, pathogen control, controlling the pathogens that can attack us. 
So particularly in those areas of the undeveloped world where people have felt compelled to put night soil in rice paddies and places like that where there's contact with water, the uh, pathogen cycle can be quite vicious and unfortunate. Um, putting it directly in the soil is probably better. In this case, treating human waste in a composting process before it's used as fertilizer can is a very effective means to control the pathogens. Probably overall more effective than the water-based systems, I have to say. People think of the water-based systems as being 100% uh, effective, they are not. Uh, but in any case, this there are a lot of different composting systems. I have come to believe that the simplest is by far the best. You simply build two tanks, or in this case one big tank with a partition down the middle, so you have two tanks. You have some blocks or something at the bottom and then a, a screen mesh so the air can get under the pile of, of human waste and wood chips or leaves or whatever you're using. Uh, you want to keep a mix in there, carbon-nitrogen balance as they say. So the air stays under it and works through it and keeps it in an aerobic uh, decomposition process instead of an anaerobic decomposition process. You use one tank uh, until it starts to get full, then you close off that tank and use the other tank. An even simpler version of this is simply to use 55-gallon drums instead of tanks. And then you can have two or three or ten or however many you need. You fill one, you roll it aside, fill the next, roll it aside. Um, with a tank system like this, you're s I'm assuming that we're going to use one side for nine months or a year so that the other side will be able to decompose for nine months a year or a year and time alone is a very effective the combination of time and, and the aerobic decomposition process should quite effectively control pathogens. Um, this is a composting toilet that I built uh, with a nice mosaic tile floor connected directly to the house. Uh, quite effective and not uh, unattractive we hope. Um, this is the composting toilet under construction uh, you can see the big tank with the partition wall going down the middle. We'll put some waterproofing material on the concrete uh, so we don't have any seepage uh, going. The floor level is right at the top of the block where the block meets the wood. There'll be a uh, concrete floor across the top there. Uh, this is a technology that we are not employing at Living Energy Farm, but I couldn't help but show it to you because I like it so much. It's a very simple technology that uh, converts uh, skylights, if you happen to have skylights, from a net energy loss to a net energy gain. Uh, there's a company called Zomeworks, that Z-O-M-E works, that builds a commercial version of these skylight covers. Um, I built these particular ones and you can build them quite cheaply. You just get yourself some uh, aluminum roofing and some aluminum uh, angle that you can get at the hardware store and some stainless steel bolts and whatnot. You build a cover that sits about a foot over the skylight. This is a south facing roof in this case. Um, and this is the summer position. So in the summer, that direct heat that would normally come right through the skylight is blocked, but you still get good light coming around the skylight. In the wintertime, you kick this skylight up and it connects to these poles, so it's up at an angle, so the, the winter sun that's coming in at a lower angle bounces off the bottom of those reflective covers and into the skylight, so the skylight then becomes a very effective solar, uh, passive solar collection system. So uh, these are uh, very simple, very nifty little technology that improves habitability. Um, this is a technology that we have not yet employed at Living Energy Farm. Um, it is on the list of things to build that we are going to build, I hope. Um, this was developed by a community in Colombia called Gaviotas. and It's a high temperature solar thermal cooking system. Uh, they have what are essentially flat plate collectors over here. Uh, I think they were using peanut oil, but you use some kind of oil to run through the collectors that gets heat heated up to several hundred degrees at least. goes into a storage tank. Uh, the heat is then stored and can be used the next day or whenever. It's pumped out and run through steam jacketed kettles so you can uh, cook with it uh, either inside of a building or if you can store the heat till the next day. Um, I think the limitation of this system is going to be storing three, four, five hundred degree fluid. Uh, it's going to be a bit tricky, uh, but we'll see. If we can do this, this would be great because the advantage of this um, is if we can store heat uh, we don't have to feed it the way we do a biogas digester. With a biogas digester you have to feed it every day and you have to have sufficient organic material to you have to be able to put something in there. This, uh, if we could get it to work, would be adaptable to rural or urban settings. You don't have to feed it with anything. The disadvantage of course is it's a bit mechanically complicated or more complicated than some of the technologies we use. Um, you can use a fryer oil pump on the cold side of that loop coming out to the uh, uh, out to the steam jacketed kettle, so a pump that's made for commercial French fryers, basically. Uh, but even so, you're looking at you know a bunch of expensive metal pipe, and the pumps themselves are expensive. This is somewhat more complicated than some of the things we do. 
this is another technology that we hope to build soon, uh, Solar Ice Maker. There are two organizations at least that have built these. One is called Stevens, uh, and that's an acronym. The other is called the Isaac, Isaac uh, uh, Ice Maker. They're basically the same thing as far as I am aware. Um, I know the fellow who developed the Stevens one, I'm, he was at Cornell University. I don't know if he's still alive or not. I visited him 20 years ago, 15 years ago at least. Um, his purpose was to develop technologies that were simple, cheap, and easy that would help people living in, um, in the less developed world in villages um, so that to have, you know, to be able to do things. Like in this case, you know, the hope would be that at a health clinic where they needed to keep their vaccines uh, refrigerated or something, they would be able to build this ice maker cheaply, easily, and then use the ice like in an old-fashioned ice box, bring the, the block of ice in each day to help uh, keep a, a solar refrigeration system cool. Uh, so the way this works is this is a parabolic uh, dish. As you can see, the pipe runs at the focal point of the parabolic dish. Uh, there's ammonia in that pipe and an ammonia absorptive chemical, the name of which I don't remember, but if you look it up on the internet, you can find it under Stevens or Isaac, as I said. So what happens during the day, um, the um, heat, solar heat, uh, heats up that pipe, which pressurizes the ammonia, it pushes it up this pipe, the pipe goes around and around in a coil, it is either air-cooled or left in a water bath and water-cooled, and then there's an ammonia storage tank down here. Uh, so during the day, the ammonia is pressurized, some of the heat is evaporated off, and then the pressurized ammonia is stored in a tank. At night, this pipe cools off, and the ammonia begins in a reverse migration back up this coil, back out to, to this big pipe out here, which uh, functions as a secondary storage tank, essentially. And the process of that ammonia evaporating and depressurizing soaks up heat, which is the same thing as refrigeration, so you get a block of ice down here. Um, it's a very simple ice maker, no moving parts, no electronics, no computers, uh, simply a 24-hour cycle ice maker using ammonia and solar heat. Um, whoops, went in the wrong direction there. Let's go this way. Um, so let's talk about ecology. Um, unfortunately, the primary forces driving uh, our understanding of environmentalism in the modern industrial world are political and not uh, scientific or rational. And what's happened is we've come, become very so focused on energy sources. The big green windmill on the hill that can produce enough renewable energy and make jobs and save us from dirty coal, nuclear, oil, whatever. Uh, that mentality is, is misinformed um, for a number of reasons. But if we want to talk about, okay, so if, if that's what's wrong, what's right, what really does work? And what really works is to think about it in terms of a pyramid. 90% of the battle of how do we live sustainably is all about context. It's what are we building, where, for who, uh, and what are we doing with it. So a house on a mountaintop is never sustainable because it's in the wrong place. Um, the, the kind of development we have, the, the way we build, tends to be sustainable because it's built for, uh, for things. That, a lot of it is things that we do not need, put in the wrong place, uh, used by too few people or used not very intensively. So the context is what matters the most. That's 9% of the battle. 9% of the battle is conservation. So after we've got the right context, we, we're building what we need, where we need it, we're sharing the use of it, um, then we would invest 9% of our resources into energy conservation, insulating, insulating well, sealing up, that sort of thing. 1% uh, of the battle is energy source. This is exactly the inverse of what we're accustomed to thinking, but it is what actually works. What does that mean in the real, wor real world? Uh, that means that, um, that renewable energy is really well suited to village level use, community level use, and really badly suited to uh, individual uh, level use, private houses, private cars, that sort of thing. Um, how hard is it to dramatically reduce the amount of fossil fuel we use? Not too hard if we're looking at it uh, realistically in terms of what actually works, and what actually works is community village level use. So here's a few pictures. This is a Woodfolk house. It's a house in Charlottesville. It is a straw bale house. It is cooperatively used. It has a big flat plate solar collection system on the roof that heats the water for the house as well as heating the house. Um, the primary thing that makes this house uh, efficient is the cooperative usage of the house. Uh, the second thing, second most important thing, is the nice big 18-inch thick straw bale walls. 
The least important but not insignificant part is good solar heating, both passive solar, there's windows there, there's windows off the left side there that you can't see, in this case also active solar heating with flat plate collectors. Uh, they are expensive but I actually got these used. As I said with Living Energy Farm, we're trying to mimic the same kind of process with air so we can do it more cheaply. Uh, this house, I was frankly quite shocked when I started crunching numbers, uses 9% as much energy per capita uh, as compared to other, other houses. So in other words, somebody living in that house is using 91% less energy than someone living in the average American home or apartment. Um, this is uh, uh, a house at Dancing Rabbit Eco Village in Missouri. They have focused more on PV power and less on direct solar heat. Uh, but they average, they, uh, they uh, estimate their average energy use to be around 10% of the national average. Uh, again, because of cooperative use, uh, appropriate context, uh, village level scaling, good insulation, and then putting renewable energy on top of that. Um, the renewable energy really is the least important part. Uh, fossil energy would be sustainable or close to sustainable if it were cooperatively used with good insulation, with proper context, pro proper conservation measures. Um, but the trick is that once you've reduced your energy load down really small, it then becomes really much, much, much easier to make that final jump over to renewable energy. So your average American home that has a massive heat pump that's got you know a two horsepower motor on it thumping away, you, there's no hope of running that heat pump with renewable energy. It just it's, it doesn't work. It's not going to happen. Whereas uh, Woodfolk House right here, I can speak the most about that house because I built it, I understand it. There's a single 80 watt pump that can run all of those solar hot water collection panels. So if, we, if I wanted to, it's actually an AC pump running it, but if I wanted to convert it to a DC photovoltaic pump, it's just 80 watts. It's not the you know, thousands of watts it takes to run a heat pump. So that's the point, that once you've brought renewable energy, your energy demands down to a level that renewable energy can meet easily, more easily, then renewable energy starts to work really well. So to take you know uh, this house or this house completely off grid and run it without any fossil fuel is pretty easy because it's 90% of the way there already. That is not true in the average American residential home. Twin Oaks is a community in Louisa County. Uh, this is uh, their most environmentally oriented building. It has both uh, solar hot water as well as photovoltaic power. It also has a lot of passive solar design built into it. That house will, uh, the two, first two houses up here were straw bale. This one's actually stud frame with thick walls, like 8 inch, 10 inch thick walls. Um, but they're all very similar in terms of being super insulated, basically, really well insulated. Uh, Twin Oaks, this is the most environmental building at Twin Oaks. Their other buildings are not nearly so well built. They probably come out somewhere around 40%. The numbers there are a bit hard to calculate because of, for various reasons that involve the mixing of, of residential and commercial energy usage. But in any case, uh, still doing pretty good. But the other important thing to notice is that most people in the world live pretty sustainably because they can't afford to do otherwise. Um, and the reason to raise that point is not to just to provoke a bit of liberal guilt of, oh, let's feel sympathy for the poor people around the world, but rather to point out the, the big issue around sustainability or to, to question the definition of environmentalism in, uh, in the United States. Uh, is environmentalism really environmentalism, or is it about justifying or putting a coat of green paint on our heavy consumption of energy and resources? Because most people in the world live humbly because they can't afford to do otherwise, and that in that very modesty, they live largely sustainably. And then we live very immodestly and then do a bunch of silly things to try to make ourselves feel better. Uh, one of the silly things that we do is grid tie solar. Uh, this is a picture right out the back of my house in Charlottesville. Uh, this is a brand new subdivision. These are houses that sold for three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. It is a cul-de-sac subdivision. Uh, there's each one of these houses has a single family or even just a couple in it without kids. That's considered perfectly normal, even though the houses are quite large. Everybody's got their own pickup truck, their own SUV. Uh, cul-de-sac subdivision, people like that. And if you look way back in the back there, there's your grid tie solar system. Now this is a close-up of that grid tie solar. So we've got a house with uh, poor insulation, thin, ordinary walls. The context is pretty poor because it's, it, although it's in a city, which is perhaps better context than being out in the middle of a rural area, uh, but these people I'm still quite confident drive to work. Uh, there's no solar features whatsoever, no insulation, 
uh, way too many square foot per person for anything one could reasonably call sustainable. And then we come back and put this big grid tie solar rack up there. Um, I could count those panels and figure it out, but I suspect that's seven kilowatts or more on that roof. Uh, the funny thing I've noticed about these grid tie systems is they're often poorly oriented, meaning not facing south all that well, or they're shaded. In this case, we've got a cute little satellite dish up there, which is knocking out a bunch of your solar power, at least in the morning. Um, why would these things be shaded? Well, because, you know, the people inside still have a big electric heat pump and electric water heater. The purpose of that solar rack is not re about renewable energy, really, or not about sustainability, really. It's about feeling better. It's about an environmental movement that helps us feel better about our consumptive patterns. So let's go through a few points that I've written out down here at the bottom. The current supply side approach funded by tax rebates is not is based on the assumption that renewable energy supply displaces, displaces fossil fuel energy in generation. Historical evidence does not support this conclusion. In other words, we're supporting this big grid tie thing uh, on, based on the assumption that it reduces the amount of coal or nuclear that we're using. Well, that's basically not true for the most part because the big baseload plants, the coal and nuclear plants, they're huge uh, plants that cannot be heated up or cooled off very quickly. They plan hours or even days in the future of how much energy they're going to shove into those plants. It takes uh, many hours to heat one of those plants up to full capacity. So they keep those plants heated up and then, you know, along comes wind and solar. The wind blows a little bit, stops blowing, the clouds come in front of the solar panels and they cannot adjust the power output necessarily on a large scale to accommodate the fluctuations in, fluctuations in renewable energy, never mind the fluctuation between day and night for solar. So there is perhaps some displacement, but not nearly as much as we would like to believe. For the most part, the way we are using renewable energy is not displacing uh, fossil energy. It's simply being added on uh, to the top of it. Uh, variability. Uh, means one must produce much more energy than is being used to cover the fluctuations of wind and sun. If you were going to have an electrical grid that was entirely based on wind and sun, you would have to have something about 18 times the size of what we have now. That's roughly the number of how much generation capacity you would need to cover the fluctuations of wind and sun. And you think about how expensive and difficult it has been to build and maintain the grid that we currently have, and you think about building 18 of those, and you start to realize that this is really a silly game that we're playing uh, in terms of thinking we're using renewable energy for environmental as opposed to psychological palliative purposes. There's also a fundamental contradiction here that lower energy prices stimulates more use. It's called Jevons Paradox. So if we do go out and find new energy sources, what does that mean? Does it mean you know, bio, you know, uh, ethanol powered chainsaws or, or biodiesel bulldozers? I mean, what does it mean? Uh, hydrogen-powered bulldozers? What are we doing with renewable energy? What's the context? Uh, we have an economy that thrives on ecological destruction. We're using far more than we need, and we're putting a little bit of green paint over it, but the basic question of what are we doing and why is, is going unaddressed. Um, renewable energy works really well if it's used in the right context. In the wrong context, it does more harm than good. And that's difficult for most folks to understand because they've been sold the wrong message so many times. But that is the case. Uh, number three down here, more production equals more pollution. Spain has seen a 40% increase in carbon pollution in the last 20 years in spite of being a leading installer of solar and wind power. Renewable energy by itself does not reduce fossil fuel use. Uh, that particular statistic is pulled from a book uh, called Green Illusions by Ozzy Zinner. Uh, it's a good book, very recent book. My book, uh, Integrated Activism, talks some about these issues and also talks a lot about the relationship between ecology and politics, basically, the way uh, all of this has, has come about um, and how it relates to our civil society. Uh, biofuel. Biofuel is a general term that refers to a number of different kinds of fuel, everything from ethanol to biodiesel to wood gas to, in this case, wood. Uh, this picture dates back to the 1800s. Uh, people think of renewable energy as being a benign thing. Uh, it is only benign if it is used in the appropriate context and after appropriate conservation measures have been taken. What happened, the brief history of industrial use of fuel, is that in Europe, particularly in England, uh, they used wood before they used coal and they cut the forest down by the early 1600s and then switched to coal because they had to. This picture is from the United States. You see a steam-powered 
a log hauler up front there and logs after logs after logs after logs after logs going off into the sunset there. What people don't realize is that the United States was also largely deforested by the mid-1800s. So a couple of hundred years later than what happened in England, but nonetheless, we deforested the whole continent, except for the most remote mountaintops and swamps, to cut down trees largely to make steam. And by about 1850 or so, we'd run out of trees and converted to coal. It was not an overnight conversion, simply the fact that firewood got more and more expensive and the industrial users of firewood had to convert to coal. Uh, a book that I would strongly recommend, Richard Wilkinson, uh, Poverty and Progress, outlines this development of these technologies. So the idea that we can go back to 1850, to prior to 1850, and use wood uh, or other biofuels to fuel our industrial economy is historically grossly misinformed. Uh, it pays no attention to our own history. Um, nonetheless, Dominion Power here in Virginia is getting tax rebates to do precisely that. They're cutting down enormous piles of trees, shoving them in the big steam turbines in what used to be coal plants to make electricity so people can run their tumble dryers and air conditioners. Um, why would we do that? Again, it's, it's the same reason we're putting up grid tie solar. It's palliative. It is a psychological game that we're playing to make ourselves feel better. Uh, it is not has nothing to do with sustainability, not real sustainability. What makes renewable ener energy not work? This is supply-side approach. This is the hydrogen and veggie oil-powered stretch Hummer, the rather extreme icon of uh, the supply-side approach that, you know, the idea that if we just had enough renewable, magic renewable energy from somewhere, we can keep doing stupid things and not suffer from the uh, re results of our own decisions. It's not going to work. It's simply not going to work. Renewable energy works really well in the right context. It is more does more harm than good in the wrong context. So here's a slide with a bunch of words on it. I promise you I will move through this quickly and efficiently. Um, this is talking about this central column is a list of renewable energies. The left-hand column is how well does this renewable energy work in private housing in ordinary American uh, the ordinary American economy, and how well the right hand column is how well does that technology work at a village level or in a community level or with shared use. Um, so let's go down the list here. Passive solar. How well does that work in private housing in the mainstream? It works great. Passive solar, you almost can't do it wrong. It's really easy. It's really simple. It, well, I won't say you can't do it wrong. Don't put the end windows on the east and west side. Put them on the south side have a little bit of an overhang. Beyond that, you almost can't do it wrong. It's really easy, it's really simple, and it makes any house or any building much more pleasant to be in. Um, how does passive solar work in community? Works great, just like it does in the mainstream. Biofuels, the general term that incorporates so many, bi uh, so many different uh, forms of energy. How does it work in mainstream America? It is disastrous. Uh, the centralized scaling, we're trying to develop these huge power plants, um, that are going to ship. Biofuel tends to be really bulky and tends to take a lot of energy to produce energy. So when you get these big centralized plants, they become really inefficient, basically. And it has, does nothing to address the consumptive end use. So we have incredibly complex, inefficient energy production systems that are then making energy that we are then using for really foolish purposes. Uh, ethanol is perhaps the worst. It takes three or four gallons of fuel to produce four or five gallons of fuel. There's a marginal gain at best, um, and yet we are pursuing that very vigorously again because it makes us feel better. Um, biofuels, how do they work at the village or community level? They can work well because there the scaling can be much more modest. Instead of having this huge centralized inefficient biofuel plant, you can have, you know, you can have biofuel, whether it's wheat straw or, or wood chopped from around the village, uh, used at a modest level in the village. Um, at a community level, uh, it certainly can work much uh, better because the scaling and distances are much more appropriate um, and you get a much better complementarity. So the ashes coming out of the, the biogas or the uh, wood gas system can go right back out on the field and they function as fertilizer. The sludge coming out of the biogas digester can also go out on the field and function as fertilizer. You can rake the chicken manure out of your chicken coop and put it in the biogas digester. You get this really tight complementarity of systems that falls apart when you centralize systems. Just to give one more example, the, in the United States we build these huge uh, electrical generation plants that run generally around 35 percent efficiency. In other words, the big coal plants, about 65 percent of the energy they generate is lost as heat and only about 35 percent or so 
actually gets made into electricity. Well, what people do in other parts of the world is they build these power plants, smaller power plants near cities, particularly in Europe where they need a lot of heat in the wintertime. They generate electricity, but then they take that heat and they pump it down steam pipes and heat residential or commercial buildings with it. It can uh, take the efficiency level from 35% to 95%. It can have an enormous difference, um, make an enormous difference. So that scaling, the, the context and the scaling are what makes it work or not work with so many of these technologies. Super insulation, thick walls, whatever they are made out of. Why does that work in the mainstream? No, it does not work. It is too expensive. And I have had so many conversations with so many people. Uh, they tell me they bought their house, they remodeled the kitchen, they fixed it up, it's pretty, oh, but by the way, we can't afford to insulate it well. I've heard the story many times, I don't really worry about it so much anymore, but the reality is, and we have to be honest with ourselves, the reality is that we value square footage far more than we value anything we call sustainability. Um, with shared use and more modest square footage, then insulation becomes uh, super insulation. Thick walls becomes economically viable. So it can start to work in community. When you have multiple users that divides the cost, you have uh, a mathematical incentive to build better structures, to build better machines, more durable machines, to do things better. Um, one has to also ad address or recognize the status symbol uh, the need or desire people have for social status, and that's really what's driving, has driven now for centuries, the uh, dominant force driving housing design and building design in general in the industrial world in the United States. So we need to think about that as well. Grid tie photovoltaics, do they work in the mainstream? No, they don't. Uh, externalities are ignored. There's enormous amount, an enormous amount of toxic byproducts from, uh, from the production of photovoltaic panels. Um, there's a lot of mining of expensive metals and whatnot. Those externalities are ignored with grid tie systems. We simply put them up and assume they are benign, and there's no incentive to conserve. We put up those big grid tie systems without taking out the electric water heater or getting rid of the heat pump or insulating the building. Uh, so grid tie is a net environmental loss in the mainstream. Is it a, does it work better in community? In my experience, no, it doesn't. For the same reason, externalities are ignored and uh, there's no incentive to conserve. Off-grid photovoltaics, is it an environmental benefit in private housing? Generally not, because people are installing large banks of lead-acid batteries, which are very expensive, very toxic, and don't last very long, uh, assuming they need that big bank of lead-acid batteries to meet a heavy power demand. Uh, can off-grid photovoltaics work in uh, community and village-level use? They can work a lot better because, again, the scaling is much more modest. Uh, we, uh, as I said, at Living Energy Farm, we're using the nickel iron batteries. Uh, but the, the modesty is the main issue. Uh, the modesty was what allows you to use nickel iron batteries. Uh, but in any case, so off-grid photovoltaics has a lot more potential at the village level than it does for private housing. Solar cooking. This is an excellent example. It's really simple, really easy, and about as sustainable as you could possibly be, and it does not work at all in mainstream America with private housing and everybody commuting to work, simply because it doesn't fit the lifestyle. There's nobody around to tend the cooker. Everybody's off in their cubicle or doing whatever they're doing. Whereas at a village level, at a community level, where one person can cook for other people, or at the extended family level, if you want to use that term, solar cooking is super simple, super easy, works great. Uh, high temperature solar cooking, this is uh, experimental technology. But even if we develop it, it's not going to work in the American lifestyle because you have to fiddle with it. You have to be there to take care of it. Um, whereas at a village level where one person can cook for other people, it will work great. Um, biogas. Biogas is, is a lot like having a wood stove instead of a thermostatic uh, heat in your house and that you have to fiddle with it. You have to feed it every day, basically. Um, it will not work in the mainstream America because people aren't going to tend it. They aren't going to fiddle with it even if they wanted it. Um, it just takes too much, too much attention. Whereas at the village level, it could work just fine. Uh, the integration of systems, the uh, locality of biofuel relative to its end use, uh, the tying together of things in the appropriate context would make makes biogas work at the village level. Wood gas, does it work in the mainstream? No, it's not going to work. That's the reason people have favored ethanol and biodiesel, is because it fits the commuter culture. Uh, wood gas doesn't fit the commuter culture at all. It's a very fiddly fuel. You have to mess with it a lot. Um, even in, and even if we could use it as a commuter fuel, it would be disastrous if we did. Uh, can it work at a community level? It certainly can, required, uh, provided we keep our use uh, reasonably modest. 
the sources of fuel and the use of fuel are very close together. Uh, the byproducts are fertilizer instead of pollution, by and large. Um, so wood gas could work quite well at a community level. How do we make environmentals more values more of a priority? So, you know, there's all of this environmental information out there, everything from an inconvenient truth to all these, you know, books by various famous people, and yet we still don't seem to embrace uh, the information all that well. Uh, I think the way we make environmental values more of a priority is by choosing to rely on them instead of decorating fossil fuel systems with them. If you use your bicycle to commute to work, you have a good bicycle because you need it, you use it, you take care of it. Um, then if you move out to the country and you can't use your bicycle to commute to work anymore because it's too far, you feel like you have to have a car, you end, you end up with a really nice car. Thus, not coincidentally, most Americans have really nice cars, or expensive cars, and crappy bicycles if they have one at all. So if we put ourselves in the situation where we're going to choose to rely on village level renewable energy systems that are designed to fit in the appropriate context that are designed to conserve energy as much as possible then uh, we will take care of those technologies we, technologies will take care of those machines we will develop them well if we do the grid tie thing and simply paint a renewable energy over the top of a fossil energy then it's going to be shaded it's not going to be well taken care of we don't care um, so that's the reality of what we've got so we have to face the fact that our culture is in a state of collective psychosis. Uh, psychosis, I say this having worked with mentally ill people quite a bit, um, is a detachment from reality. And when the psychosis is collective, then it doesn't seem like it's madness, but it is. For an entire civilization to uh, work rapidly towards its own destruction is, uh, is a crazy thing to do, a psychotic thing to do but because we're all doing it together, somehow it becomes okay. Um, and so many people are out there, oh well, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do, there's everything you can do. And in fact, doing it would make your life better. Um, you know, the problem, of course, is the status symbols. We, we want to believe that we value the environment more than we value our own social status. The reality is that we, meaning most of us, do not. Um, and uh, perhaps I sound judgmental, that's, you can decide, but for me, I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to say what people want to hear, I'm going to say what I understand to be true. And what is true is that the only way renewable energy works is in the right time, context, and that context is community. Call it village, call it community, call it extended family, call it what you want. Uh, like it or not, you have to choose between your car and your house, or your children and the ent entire global ecosystem that will allow them to live. That's simply the reality of it. There is nothing that can power your private house and your private car on a sustainable basis. It can't be done. We're talking about a restructuring of the industrial economy, whether we like it or not. The train is already moving. We're going to be on that train or under that train. Those are the only two options we have. We can't stop the process of change that is moving so rapidly around us. We only can choose whether we uh, invest the time and energy to develop more conscious control over our culture, over our society, um, and use that conscious control, that conscious uh, direction to choose a renewable, sustainable society, or we're under the train, we get run over by the forces of historical change. Um, ironically enough, in another 100 years or 200 years, whichever choice we make, uh, it's going to look fairly simple. We're going to be living in renewable energy-based villages in 200 years. And if we do it by accident, they're going to be, it's going to be an ugly, brutal, process that's going to leave us in really bad shape. If we do it on purpose, perhaps we can uh, do it much more uh, pleasantly. Um, so the irony is that, you know, for all the destruction we've done, undoing that destruction is actually makes your life better. Uh, getting in more involved in your community, developing cooperative use systems improves your social network. You develop social networks, so if you're sick or if you need help, there are people around to help you. Um, there are many, many different ways of living cooperatively, of using resources cooperatively, and that's really what makes uh, makes it all work. That's what makes it come together. Um, so I'm going to do some more slideshows. I'm going to talk about other aspects, other issues that I've talked about in the book Integrated Activism. Uh, for now, this book, this slideshow was focused largely on Living Energy Farm. Um, again, my website is conav.org. That's c-o-n-e-v.org. Uh, Living Energy Farm is livingenergyfarm.org. The Intentional Communities Movement is at ic.org. Um, I hope you enjoyed the slideshow. Uh, look forward to hearing from you if you are so inclined. Have a good day.